Welcome to this Osset History Podcast, where we're going to try and talk a little bit about the origins of the Cold War and why it all kicked off after 1945. If you were tackling an interpretation question like this, and you will be doing in your AS exam, you'll need to consider the strengths of the interpretation, the limitations of the interpretation, before coming to some sort of conclusion. In this exam, uh, certainly AS level, you'll also be doing an essay question. Um, if this is an A2 preparation for an exam, you won't be doing an interpretation question at all. But it doesn't matter because the information in this podcast will be useful for whatever type of question comes up on the origins of the Cold War, if indeed one does. What exactly caused the USA and the USSR to initiate, initiate what became known as the Cold War, in which both nations spent time, some lives and vast amounts of money trying to outdo each other, is a really interesting question, I think. And John Mason suggests that both the USSR and the USS USA wanted to destroy the ideology of their rival. And that this fueled the Cold War, the confrontation, and, and itself caused it. There are both reasons to support this interpretation and reasons to suggest that it may have limitations. And that's what the point of this podcast is, after all. So, first, the strengths. Well, let's start with this fella. Karl Marx, the person who wrote Das Kapital and the theory of communism was in that book. Part of the theory of communism was that it would spread all around the globe from one country to the next as the poor working class people finally overthrew their bosses who had clearly taken advantage of them for so long by paying them so little and working them so hard. When Lenin and his Bolshevik party, which believed in communism, did his, his Bolshevik party, when they took over Russia in October 1917, Lenin had his own slightly adjusted theory of communism. It was like his interpretation of communism, which he called Marxism-Leninism, because it's got Marx's name in it and Lenin's name in it. And it's a bit of a mouthful, and it makes me think that Russians aren't very good at coming up with names. Anyway... This Marxism-Leninism theory also agreed that the writings of Karl Marx were right when they said there should be worldwide communist revolution. So to sum that all up, the whole communist thing and the Soviet Union believed in worldwide revolution and they provided whatever sources they could to help other communists around the world to overthrow their governments and seize power on behalf of the working class. And doing that would destroy capitalism. In 1919, there's a bit of proof because they've created a group called Comintern. That's my Russian accent. Did you like it? Which was to try to help to encourage this worldwide communist revolution. But in 1943, in a gesture of goodwill and to show perhaps his honest intentions, Stalin, by then the leader of the Soviet Union, had Comintern disbanded, finished, kaput, no more. This came at a time when Stalin was in the Grand Alliance with Britain and the US, fighting the Germans. So perhaps that's why he was quite willing to disband Comintern. But in 1947, when the Grand Alliance was breaking up and the Cold War was beginning, he reintroduced a group with the goal of spreading communism worldwide and called it Cominform, which sounded annoyingly like Comintern, and even I forget which is which sometimes. So, all of this information tells us that the ideology of communism, the formation of Comintern in 1919, and then the formation of Form in 1917, well, they all suggest that the communists did indeed want to destroy capitalism, and it was a fundamental aspect of the aims of communism. All of which suggests that John W. Mason might be right in his interpretation. As for the capitalists, us, we are the capitalists. If you're unsure about this whole capitalism thing, you live in a capitalist country. Well, the capitalists believe that everybody should be free to buy and sell things as they please, with a, only a little bit of interference from the government. This is the opposite to communism, where the government completely controls the economy and tries to make life for everyone as fair as possible through their control of the economy. The capitalist system our country, is almost the opposite to the communist system. There's democracy in capitalism, 
people get to vote. People can own their own property and businesses. And people are able to get filthy, stinking rich. This is indeed what many Americans were, and actually are, filthy, stinking rich. And the people who would be set to lose out the most to communism would be rich people. America is controlled by politicians, and the politicians of America are pretty much all rich. Therefore, America was opposed to communism. But where's the proof that they were opposed to communism? Well, the communists had common turn and common form. Um, and, and, well, in 1917 comes the first bit of evidence. Because when the Russian Civil War broke out, after the Bolsheviks took over Russia, and the Bolsheviks were communists, well... The USA and other capitalist countries, including Britain, gave assistance to the White Army, which was trying to fight the communists, whose army was called the Red Army. Again, Russians not very imaginative with their names. So anyway, as soon as the communists had taken over their first government in the world, the first thing the USA tried to do was destroy it. This also clearly supports Mason's theory that the USA wanted to destroy communism. For the next few decades, the US and the USSR didn't really have much to do with each other through the 20s and the 30s. But that all changed with the Second World War. Here, the communists would say that the USA was trying to cause the destruction of the USSR, not with what they were trying to do, but what they were not doing, even whilst in the Grand Alliance. Because what the USA were not doing, which Stalin was not very happy about, was they weren't invading France. It took them till 1944 to open a second front. Communists argued, and Stalin seemed to believe, that the US and Britain were quite happy to see the Nazis in the USSR fight each other to exhaustion. After the end of the war, the US President Truman gave his Truman Doctrine speech, in which he said that it was the goal of America to support free peoples, by which he meant the US would commit itself to helping people be free of communism and dictatorships. And afterwards, the US gave something out called Marshall Aid, which was a load of free cash to help countries in Europe to recover from the effects of the war, so that people climbed out of poverty. And remember, poor people were attracted to communism. So Marshall Aid, by helping countries to recover and therefore make people less poor, was something which would make communism a less popular ideology in Europe. So the evidence that the USA wanted to destroy communism well came from their reluctance to open a second front in the Second World War, their sending of aid to the White Army in 1917, the Truman Doctrine of 1947 and the accompanying Marshall Aid all would be support for the interpretation from John W. Mason. However... What about the limitations? Because you've got to do a paragraph if you're doing an interpretation questions on strengths. We just did that. And then you've got to do a paragraph on limitations. Well, one argue go argument goes that the Cold War did not break out because the USA and USSR wanted to destroy each other at all. But instead, they fell out because they had different aims and hopes for Europe and the world in general after the Second World War. The USSR was traumatised by two German invasions in less than 40 years. Both invasions causing massive loss of life and huge loss of money and resources as well. 25 million Soviet citizens died in the Second World War. Just get that number in your head. It's mental, especially when you consider that compared to the 25 million Soviets that died, 400,000 British died. That's right. And think of how traumatic the Second World War was for, for the British in our history. And we fought for six years as well and lost 400,000 people, which is an absolute tragedy. I mean, I can't even imagine 400,000 people dead. But 25 million when the USSR only joined in the war in 1941 and fought for just four years. So one of Stalin's main aims after the war was to establish a buffer zone in Europe. So a buffer zone is like a gap, you know, like a buffer on a Dodgem car or something stops you from bashing the car into the side. Um, and what they wanted was some friendly countries in between Germany and the USSR. And this would hopefully make it harder for any future German army, or indeed any 
capitalist army uh, wanting to invade so the Soviet Union in the future. The main country that stood between Germany and the USSR was Poland. And in Poland and other countries like, for example, Romania, Stalin thought the only way to ensure a friendly government was to have a communist government because he liked communists, you see. He liked communists and big moustaches. Stalin also wanted massive reparations, which is like the country word for compensation. Anyway, they wanted massive reparations from the Germans for the unimaginable amount of damage and suffering caused by the German invasion. And he wanted to ensure that a future Germany would be weakened and more easily controlled. And to be fair, I think if I was Russian, I'd probably be hoping my leader would try to take steps to stop the Germans being able to invade again, especially after the whole 25 million deaths thing, and I'd probably want some sort of compensation too. However, the British and Americans had other ideas. The British, of course, had gone to war in response to the German invasion of Poland in the first place. So it was unacceptable to the British that Poland would lose its independence after all British had sacrificed, or Britain had sacrificed since 1939. The US, well, they joined in the war a bit later, and perhaps were less committed to the whole Polish independence thing because of having gone to war over them, but they were still committed to Polish independence because they were committed to a free Europe with countries that would have democratically elected governments in free elections that weren't you know, tampered with or anything, and they wanted there to be able to be free worldwide trade. So this included Poland and other states in Eastern Europe, and of course that wouldn't be able to happen if they were communist. So the USSR, traumatised, wanted a communist buffer zone, including Poland, as a protection from invasion. And the USA wanted free elections across Europe, including in Poland. The US and Britain also, unlike the USSR, didn't want to punish Germany too harshly, because both the US and Britain believed that they'd punished Germany harshly after the First World War, and that that had led to the rise of Hitler and then World War II. So they didn't want to make the same mistake twice, which is kind of understandable. But it's also understandable that the Soviets wanted loads of compensation for the damage. They're both facts. These were the aims of the two different sides. The US and the USSR also disagreed on many, many other things in Europe, and you need to research those and have a look at them. But these are the main things. So rather than it being the USA and USSR wanting to destroy each other, perhaps it was more the case that they had different aims for Europe after the World War. And just the fact that they were the two most powerful nations left standing in the world after the Second World War, well, you get two really powerful nations who were trying to decide the future of the world. Well, perhaps it was quite likely they were going to argue at all. As for the Truman Doctrine and martial aid, many historians agree that the Truman Doctrine was what was called the unofficial declaration of the Cold War. So Truman didn't say, this is the beginning of the Cold War, but by giving that speech, it was kind of like saying, right, it's on. And the Truman Doctrine was where Truman, of course, stated once and for all in 1947 that the US would work to prevent the spread of communism. So if that is the case, then the Truman Doctrine, though clearly a US attempt to start to try to destroy communism, didn't cause the Cold War, because it was the announcement that the Cold War had started, not the cause of it. It was just like something else caused it, and Truman announced that, right, it's on. And, and such historians might also say that the reason Truman felt the need to make his speech and announce that the US was going to try to prevent this spread of communism was because of the disagreements between the US and the USSR over Europe between, well, the end of the war and 1947 when he gave his speech. So, there is evidence that the USSR and the US wanted to destroy each other's ideologies and that this uh, was what the whole confrontation was down to, as suggested by John Mason. Things like Comintern and Common Form, or the US support of the Whites, or the reluctance to open a second front in World War II, or you could even say the Truman Doctrine and Martial Aid, are all evidence that the USSR and the USA 
wanted to destroy each other. But there's also evidence that they didn't really want to destroy each other at all to begin with, and that only came after the Cold War actually got going. The people who believe that side of the argument, and I must confess that I'm one of those people, well, they'd argue that the US and the USSR had spent four years in a grand alliance, during which time the US sent the USSR lots of aid. And actually, for the decades before this, after the US and the White Army thing, well, the US had not spent any significant time or money trying to destroy communism before 1945. Similarly, Stalin and the communists, well, Stalin had stated his desire for communism in one country. He'd actually said he wanted to concentrate on establishing communism in the USSR, and even disbanded Comintern in 1943. So, perhaps it was the conflicting aims at the end of the war when the two most powerful countries in the world were trying to organise what would happen next in a devastated region of the world. And the USSR really wanted the added security of a set of buffer states and a weakened Germany and compensation when the USA was committed to free elections and a world in which people were able to trade freely as well. These major disagreements in Europe were disagreements that neither side were able to back down from and led to the Cold War in which each side tried to destroy the ideology of the other. So perhaps the conclusion should be that the Cold War was a confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. Fueled on both sides the, the belief that the ideology of the other side had to be destroyed, but only once it got going. It wasn't the cause of the war itself, because until after the Second World War, perhaps the two sides were not actually interested in destroying each other's ideology.